Hello and welcome back to the seemingly never-ending hydrogen sulfide series. Today we're going to be answering your most asked question. I know what you want and I've given it to you. We're going to talk about the herbs, the pills, the potions, the herbs for hydrogen sulfide, SIBO and hydrogen sulfide dysbiosis. Let's get to it. But first, 30 seconds of review. I know it sounds boring, but it's really important. Just trust me on this one. First of all, we need to talk about the bacteria that are known to make hydrogen sulfide because that's the best way that you can do a PubMed search. You can look for articles. You can look for people's experiences with this. And then number two, we're going to go over just a really brief overview of my treatment methodology because it's not just about killing the bad stuff, in my opinion. And I've alluded to this, and I've talked about this in the nutrition and the best, the best diet for hydrogen sulfide videos. If you haven't seen those, go check them out. But first and foremost, the bacteria that we know make copious amounts of hydrogen sulfide are Desulfovibrio and Bilophila. Now, the other ones that get talked about a lot have varying degrees of research on them when it comes to hydrogen sulfide specifically. And I was having a hard time researching some of these. So the two that are probably on most of your guys' minds are E. coli and Klebsiella. E. coli, it seems like the ability to make hydrogen sulfide is strain specific. So it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like the equivalent of saying humans can dance. Okay, but can they? Like some humans are really good dancers and some humans are really lousy dancers. So like Joe can't dance, but Diane can dance, right? So that's kind of the level that we're talking about here with strain specificity. Um, even though we're talking about one species, E. coli, it doesn't actually mean that all of those within that same species can produce the same stuff. So it looks like A, the, the ability to make hydrogen sulfide is very strain specific from what I was gathering on PubMed. The other thing that's weird is that I found one article suggesting that hydrogen sulfide inhibits the growth of E. coli. And, and that article would make no sense whatsoever until we take it in the context of the, sp the strain specificity that I just mentioned. So E. coli, I'm gonna put as a maybe slash question mark. Klebsiella, I found very, very little on hydrogen sulfide production specifically. Um, I'm really not super convinced that Klebsiella is a big hydrogen sulfide producer from what I was seeing on PubMed. If you have articles that suggest otherwise, please definitely share them here. I would love to learn more about that. But when I was doing my PubMed searches and my Google Scholar searches, I was really not finding a lot about that, um, even though it's speculated quite a bit. Similarly, some people have speculated and like, respected authorities within my field of functional medicine have said that Citrobacter makes hydrogen sulfide, but I have seen almost no data on PubMed to support that. I think I saw one article from like 1974, but our understanding of the microbiome has advanced quite a bit since then, so I don't know if I fully believe that. Um, and then the last one that you might want to know about is Pseudomonas. So Pseudomonas does pop up on some stool tests. I think I've mentioned this in my iron video, for example, and that one does seem to produce hydrogen sulfide. Like the articles that I was reading really, really suggest that hydrogen sulfide production is pretty ubiquitous among Pseudomonas arginosa versus E. coli where it's strain specific and things like Citrobacter and Klebsiella. I really was not finding any compelling data to suggest that they produce those gases. Although I do know and I will say that Dr. Pimentel has suggested that both E. coli and Klebsiella can make hydrogen sulfide based off of their work. So for what it's worth, those are the bacteria we're thinking about. Predominantly, I wanna focus most of our attention on Desulfa Vibrio and Bilophila, since those are the ones that are most supported. If you start looking up hydrogen sulfide gut microbiome research, really 99 point something percent of them are talking about those two bacteria. So that's what I'm gonna to choose to focus on. What is convenient though, all of the bacteria just rattled off, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, E. coli, Pseudomonas, uh, Bilophila de sulfa vibrio, they all belong to a parent phylum called proteobacteria. And oftentimes, the stuff that inhibits one of the proteobacteria will also work on other ones. That's why like oregano oil is effective against everything practically, and prebiotic fibers seem to inhibit all of these bad guys. It, there does seem to be some generality. So you could probably take what I'm saying today and translate it over to E. coli or Klebsiella or Pseudomonas, even if we're not totally sure it's making hydrogen sulfide for you specifically. 
The other thing that I wanted to mention right out the get-go is couplefold. So remember, you can have bacteria that are producing hydrogen sulfide gas that are in the colon. So you can have colonic overgrowth of hydrogen sulfide. This would be diagnosed via a stool test. So I typically use ombre um, or some similar 16S type testing. I know that Desulfa Vibrio specifically shows up on the Genova GI effects. Um, neither of the big guys, the big hydrogen sulfide producers, show up on the GI map, but all of those minor ones or questionable ones that I rattled off show up on that test. So this territory, we would be diagnosing that via a stool test. And then if you have hydrogen sulfide SIBO, that just means that the bacteria that are producing the hydrogen sulfide are up here somewhere in the small bowel. Again, this is probably review for a lot of you, but I felt like that needed to be said. Either way, having too much hydrogen sulfide is not a fun experience. So whether it's coming from the colon or the small bowel, we have these nasty little gas bubbles of hydrogen sulfide, and then that's gonna do all the nasty stuff to your body. One of the things that it does, in addition to being pretty toxic and harmful to the colon cells, the colonocytes, and it makes it difficult for them to heal and really thrive. So think like leaky colon, almost, if you will. The, the big thing that this gas does is that it will directly impair mitochondrial respiration. What is that, you might be asking. This is something I haven't talked about a ton on this channel, but I would love to do so in the future. Remember the mitochondria, they're always drawn like this in every biology textbook. They are the powerhouse of the cell. This is where you make the majority of your ATP, your energy. So because hydrogen sulfide inhibits mitochondrial respiration and it's said to be a mitochondrial toxin or poison sometimes, then things that will help heal the mitochondria might be a part of this for you as well. So keep that in mind is that we have a couple targets. We can try to potentially inhibit or kill the bacteria itself, whether it be in the small bowel or the colon. Largely, you're gonna treat that the same way, in my opinion. Uh, the difference being that if you have SIBO, you also wanna consider things like prokinetics and motility agents. Uh, you can try to neutralize the gas itself. We're gonna talk about this in a few minutes in the video. And then you can do things to try to heal and support your mitochondria since they probably took the brunt of the damage. And similarly, you can focus some attention on healing and soothing the colonocytes, the cells of the colon, since they also took the brunt of the damage. So you've got three potential targets, inhibit and kill the bacteria, neutralize the gas, and then heal the tissues and organelles that were affected the most, being the colonocytes and the mitochondria. Now let's get into those supplements. Okay, so for this part of the video, I did something kind of atypical and I printed myself some notes. So I know it looks dorky, just run with me on this because I have a protocol that I like to use in my mind. And I've been using this on hydrogen sulfide overgrowth and hydrogen sulfide SIBO for a number of years and it works really well. But I wanted to make sure that I was really thorough in this video and I thought maybe there's some stuff that I'm not aware of and I need to kind of spruce up my knowledge for you guys. So I did a really deep PubMed search and I went back through a bunch of my course notes from the probiotic advisor, Lucy Mailing, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Vasquez, uh, Dr. Pimentel, Dr. Seebecker. I went through a bunch of different resources and I did a really deep PubMed dive to verify what I was finding. Um, so that being said, this is a little bit of a laundry list. What I typically do as a pretty like standard, not glamorous hydrogen sulfide protocol, again, A, if you have SIBO, I am a huge, huge fan of prokinetics. So A, that should that should still stand and all the other crap i talk about on this channel so if you're iron deficient please treat that if you are b12 deficient please treat that make sure you're eating enough and making sure your gut brain axis works like that still stands but as far as the addressing the microbial component goes my typical protocol is going to be some form of oregano oil not super high dose like some SIBO experts would have you do but a moderate dose of oregano oil so that you're not killing all of the good bacteria in the process. Um, I do like a tableted product called ADP from Biotics Research. It's not the only oregano on planet Earth. It's just a nice one and it's an easy one to take. Um, and I do think it works really well. But if you've got like a liquid oil of oregano, that would be perfectly fine. Or there's some gel caps from North American Herb and Spice. I've used those before because they don't have as many fillers and binders as ADP does. Uh, but some form of oregano works really, really well at inhibiting these guys. Again, emphasize, 
it also inhibits everything else. So it is pretty aggressive. So you don't want to do crazy high doses of the oregano oil, but oregano does seem to work. Um, bismuth seems to work. Now you could get bismuth in the form of Pepto-Bismol, but then you have the addition of, I think it's Tylenol and the food coloring that's in it. So that's not as great. You could get bismuth in a supplement. So there's one from, oh, crap, I forget the name of the brand, uh, but it's called Biofilm Phase 2 Advanced. And it's got some alpha lipoic acid, a little bit of black cumin seed oil, and uh, the bismuth. And that's what I typically use. And you would use that in between meals as, as like a biofilm disruptor, or I guess to augment the effectiveness of your treatment. Uh, so those are the two things that I'll usually do to inhibit the bacteria. Then I really like working in prebiotics for this. Again, we talked about this a little bit in the nutrition video where I talked about the best diet for H2S. But in this case, I also like to add in galacto oligosaccharide, GOS. You could get this in the form of Bimuno, which I believe is out of the UK, or you can get a product from the United States, Claire Labs Galactomune is the name of that one. And it's GOS plus something else. I forget now. I think it's beta-glucan. But some sort of GOS GOS supplement works really, really well. And I did find articles on PubMed that suggest it inhibits both bilophila and vibrio and proteobacteria to a larger extent. So that's really rad. Um, there was also one article I found. This is where the notes come in handy. Uh, there was one article I found that suggested that GOS XOS and PHGG inhibit disulfovibrio. And we know that PHGG also feeds the good bacteria. So that's a double whammy of awesomeness. So I will typically layer in some combination of GOS and PHGG, although maybe I'll use a little bit of XOS now, uh, depending if the person can handle some FODMAPs in their protocol. And that's typically what I would do for, for like run of the mill, it still sucks, but like run of the mill H2S kind of stuff. If I was super, super convinced that this was hydrogen sulfide and they did not respond to that protocol I just gave you, that's where I would start thinking outside the box a little bit more and I would start to work in other kind of therapeutics. But I think that that base protocol of low to moderate dose oregano, um, moderate to high dose bismuth, um, you know, getting either PHGG or GOS or both on board and modifying the diet, I think that works really, really well for most people. And again, with the SIBO especially, if you have other factors going on, you still need to address that. Now, that being said, here's some others that I have seen suggested, and I'm just gonna read them off like a dweeb and give you a little bit of a laundry list. Um, and if you guys want references for any of these, there's way too many that I accumulated to actually put these in the description on YouTube. So if you want a specific article, just comment on the video and I can pop it in the, the doohickey for you. I can put it in the comments for you. Um, but anyhow, uh, I found an article that suggested melatonin can decrease disulfovibrio. I don't, and I don't remember all of these if they were animal or human studies. I think a lot of them were animal studies, to be clear. But uh, melatonin might decrease disulfovibrio, which is neat. I didn't find any data on bilophila or the others. Um, I found a lot of articles on polyphenols, lots and lots of articles. So I found three articles that say resveratrol the polyphenol in grape skin and like red wine. That, I found three articles saying that resveratrol decreases disulfovibrio. I found another one that says the combination of resveratrol plus quercetin decreases both bilophila and disulfovibrio. Um, I found several articles on green tea polyphenols or EGCG, two that said it decreased disulfovibrio, one that said it decreased bilophila, I found an article suggesting that turmeric or curcumin inhibited disulfovibrio. I found another one saying that grape polyphenols de decrease disulfovibrio, and one that said that blueberry polyphenols decreases disulfovibrio. So it seems like polyphenols are a really, really great strategy for H2S specifically. And polyphenols are anti-inflammatory to an extent that I bet that they might be helpful for the mitochondria, if I had to guess. So lots and lots of different ones. And I will say, um, all of the ones I just rattled off, resveratrol, EGCG, curcumin, and quercetin, all four of those, lots and lots and lots of research on the mitochondria thing. 
So if you type in the word resveratrol and mitochondria onto PubMed, you're going to find a boatload of stuff. And then similarly for EGCG, quercetin, curcumin, all of those have tons of research. So really that would be a double whammy particularly. Um, interestingly, I found an article that suggested that N-acetylcysteine, which is a sulfur containing amino acid supplement, and it's a glutathione precursor, there's some research that suggests that NAC might decrease both Desulfa Vibrio and Bilophila, which is pretty freaking neat. There's also some research that NAC is a biofilm disruptor for candida and some bad bacteria that I don't recall off the top of my head. So pretty neat stuff. And I'll say, because it's a glutathione precursor, very, very mitochondrial protective. Like your mitochondria loves NAC. So that would also make the list of stuff that you could do for the mitochondria. Uh, let's see, inulin, there are tons of studies. I mean, there's probably like eight or 10 studies on inulin or fructo oligosaccharides, FOS type prebiotics, inhibiting both of these guys. Now again, FOS, GOS, and XOS are all prebiotics, but they're all FODMAPs. So if you're currently doing low FODMAP, you might have to get those in really, really gradually. Although I will say, I find that GOS is very well tolerated even by people who are on low FODMAP. So for what it's worth. Uh, let's see, I already mentioned PHGG. I found a couple of articles suggesting that ginger decreases Desulfa Vibrio, and ginger is a biofilm disruptor and a quorum sensing inhibitor for a lot of bad bacteria, including Pseudomonas. I'm pretty sure it also is one or the other for Klebsiella and E. coli. And we know from my channel, at least, huge prokinetic. Ginger is such a monumental, wonderful prokinetic. The only thing to know about ginger is if you have gastritis, it might be a bit irritating. So you might have to introduce that slowly or work on some other stuff before you can add in ginger. But ginger is one of my absolute favorite herbs for people with IBS and SIBO. Um, and then cottonopsis root, uh, that's the one that I had mentioned or I had alluded to it in a previous video that Dr. Haverlech uh, posted, the, the probiotic advisor guy, he had posted that cottonopsis root uh, dangshen in Chinese medicine can be used to decrease these hydrogen sulfide producers. And I kid you not, <laughs> all of my normal sources for Dangshen just went away. Like they were all sold out for at least a year or more. So he really upset the ecosystem. Everybody was buying the damn stuff. Um, I don't know. It seems to be the polysaccharides in the plant. And I saw one article that referred to them as uh, FOS-like uh, polysaccharides. So I think that this probably is Le it has less to do with the herb itself and more to do with FOS type prebiotics and FODMAP type prebiotics inhibiting them. But for what it's worth, there was a couple of articles I found that suggested that cotonopsis might decrease both bilophila and desulfa vibrio. So that's really neat. Um, and it, it is used as an immune tonic in TCM, which is pretty, pretty nice too. That's how I had been using it. And then all of my sources went away. So that was a little annoying, not gonna lie. Um, there's a resource that I like uh, that I had come across in a Facebook group years ago called Microbiome Prescription. And you can go in there and you can look at the individual bacteria and see what decreases and increases it. Um, on that platform, they had suggested that caffeine, garlic, and triphala all can decrease one or both of these. I tried to verify that on a Google Scholar search and on PubMed, and I was not finding anything that suggested that. Um, so I don't know if those really are true. I don't know exactly how he gets his data in microbiome prescription, although a lot of the other ones turned out to be true. Um, and for the caffeine, I even tried to search for coffee because I thought maybe it was like the research study was on coffee specifically, and I could not find that. Um, so those are very, very theoretical. Um, Berberine, another really popular antimicrobial, again, acting on this piece of it, just killing, killing the bad stuff. Berberine is, is iffy. Um, the, there's a couple articles where they use berberine alone or berberine combined with other herbs, and it might decrease Desulfa Vibrio, probably not as well as oregano, to be honest with you. And then the only thing I found on Bilophila was one article said that it changed Bilophila, and one of them said that it changed the gene transcription in Bilophila wadsworthia. 
So it didn't say anything about the amount, it just said that it changed the genes. So I don't know if I would use berberine particularly for this, but that was interesting. Um, olive oil decreases disulfovibrio. Um, let's see, let me go back. Um, again, on microbiome prescription, he that platform suggested that slippery elm and folic acid might increase disulfovibrio, but I couldn't find anything to support that. So I don't think I particularly believe that. Um, Glyceriza, so licorice root, I found conflicting information. I found two studies that were combined with other Chinese herbs that suggested that the herbal combination increased disulfovibrio. But again, it was combined with a bunch of other stuff. And then there was one article that said that either licorice alone or astragalus alone, two very commonly used TCM herbs, both of those herbs as a single intervention decrease disulfovibrio. So licorice maybe, although I will say licorice is not a high dose herb typically anyway. So I don't know if you would take enough to really inhibit it very much. Um, and then last but not least on this particular list that I have is iron. I did see one article that suggested that iron supplementation might increase disulfovibrio, but then I saw another one suggesting that iron supplementation might decrease bilophila. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. Again, go back if you want to learn more. I have a whole video about whether or not iron supplementation is safe if you have SIBO. The thing to know is that you need iron to make energy and to run your gut-brain axis and get your motility running so that you can clear the bacteria and the crap out of your small bowel. So I think that replenishing iron is almost always more beneficial. Like the net result is going to be beneficial for the majority of people. Um, so again, one, one study indicating either direction. I don't know which one I want to believe. Um, and then the only others that I wanted to mention, well, no, a couple more. And then there's, there's two kind of neat interventions that are uh, a little bit more nutritional in nature that I want to run through. Sorry, by the way, this one's a really big, long video, isn't it? <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, Lucy Mailing in her hydrogen sulfide course had some interesting additional suggestions. Um, she mentioned cotinopsis. Again, I don't know how well that would work versus like inulin. I think you could just take inulin or FOS or a prebiotic or just reintroduce FODMAPs into your diet and get the same effect probably. Um, cotinopsis is a little bit expensive. Um, not terribly, but it is a little bit pricey. Um, so I don't know if I would run out and get that right away. Um, red ginseng, Korean ginseng or Asian Panex ginseng. Um, there was one study that Lucy Mailing mentioned in her course that it can decrease, um, I forget if it was disulfovibrio or bilophila or both, but that was an interesting one. Again, Asian ginseng is pretty expensive, so I would use that very sparingly. Um, molybdenum, she mentioned, which, which is interesting because molybdenum is needed for um, sulfate processing from our cells. So for what's worth, all of this that we're talking about is hydrogen sulfide made by your gut bacteria. There's a whole other world of people who genetically might be a bit intolerant of or sensitive to sulfur from supplements or sulfur in their diet. If you want me to do a video on that, I can elaborate, um, but it's, it seems a little bit tangential to what I typically talk about on this channel. So it's similar to some, so what I've told you guys before, if you comment and you want it, great, I will make that video for you. If you don't say anything, I probably won't because it seems a little bit off on a tangent. Uh, but molybdenum is needed by one of the enzymes in our cells that processes sulfate. So that was an interesting one that she pointed out. And then she also mentioned selenium, zinc, vitamin B12, which we'll talk about. And then one that I hadn't really used quite a lot is serum-derived immunoglobulins. So something like um, SBI Protect from Orthomolecular, or there's another name, um, like a brand name that I can't think of. Um, but serum-derived immunoglobulins, she said in her, in her notes that it doesn't have any research on it, but that she has found it helpful with her clients. So that's a clinical, uh, little clinical gem from Lucy Mailing, which I thought was interesting. I might use that in the future. All right, Whew. dorky notes aside. The last two things that I wanted to mention are the zinc and the vitamin B12, because those can be really cheap and useful interventions as well. So I just gave you the biggest laundry list ever of stuff that can inhibit the hydrogen sulfide producers 
whether it's by feeding the good guys or directly killing these guys. Either way, you've got a laundry list now that you can play with and choose from. So if the first couple things I mentioned to you don't really work as well, you can start kind of swapping things in and out and playing with it a bit. Um, remember though that I mentioned that we could try to neutralize the gas and we could work on the mitochondria. So this is the one I hadn't talked about up until now. Supposedly, you can neutralize some of the gas with zinc supplements. Specifically, I've heard people say that you preferably want a poorly absorbed form of zinc, like zinc acetate or zinc oxide, because the idea is that you won't absorb it very well. More of it will make it down into the small intestine and the colon. And then the zinc binds with the hydrogen sulfide gas and precipitates out as a salt and it inactivates the gas. So that's potentially a really great thing that you could do. And again, zinc acetate or zinc oxide or some cheapo form of zinc. You could literally go to Walmart, get the cheapest $5 zinc supplement you can find, and that should do the trick. Just remember, don't take like an outrageous amount of zinc because it'll start inhibiting your absorption of copper and iron and calcium and magnesium and minerals get really weird when you tinker with them directly. Um, the other thing is that when you have hydrogen sulfide uh, overproduction, one of the things that this gas can do is that it binds to and it inactivates your B12. So if you replenish your B12, A, you're just going to replenish your B12, but also vitamin B12 is needed for the mitochondria. And the particular form that supposedly is best for this per a couple of different resources is hydroxocobalamin, not methylcobalamin, not cyanocobalamin. And there's another one called adenosyl. You want hydroxocobalamin, B12. So that's the form that you want to get. And that supposedly can help directly with the gas and you're replenishing a nutrient that you need and you're helping with the mitochondria. Last but not least, because I feel like I've been talking for a really long time now at this point. Um, hopefully you don't mind. Hopefully you're still watching. Remember the mitochondria. So some of my favorite mitochondrial uh, builder up healing kind of supplements is, again, we mentioned N-acetylcysteine, resveratrol, curcumin, or some sort of turmeric supplement. Um, uh, green tea polyphenols like EGCG, uh, quercetin, alpha lipoic acid I had not mentioned yet, but a ALA is really great for mitochondria. Um, acetyl L-carnitine is great for the mitochondria. Also, you could do like uh, higher than normal doses of a lot of the B vitamins, particularly riboflavin, B12, and um, sorry, riboflavin, vitamin B2, uh, cobalamin, vitamin B12, again, this is the form you want to get, probably, um, and biotin. You could take a boatload of biotin, and the mitochondria typically really, really like that. And then general things like just vitamin D, vitamin A, and being nutritionally replete um, and iron replete will go a long way for mitochondrial purposes, and exercise and sunlight. So those are, again, that's the laundry list. If, depending on the person and their symptoms, I would probably start with like resveratrol, maybe green tea, and some of the vitamins that I rattled off as a starting kind of protocol. If you have more of histamine issues, you could choose to include um, quercetin rather. If you have a lot of inflammatory and autoimmune issues, you could layer in curcumin. Uh, curcumin and resveratrol synergize with each other and you get maximal effect when you combine them. Um, oh, and sulforaphane. The antioxidant in broccoli seed sprouts also is fantastic for the mitochondria and just glutathione in general. But um, I think you could take NAC and get the glutathione typically. I don't oftentimes use glutathione supplements unless somebody's like had mold exposure or a really bad toxic exposure. Okay, now that you have have withstood the longest video probably on this channel, minus the webinars that I posted on this channel. Ooh, okay, takeaways. Let's summarize, right? Remember, you have a couple of different places you can intervene. You can try to starve and kill and otherwise inhibit the bad bacteria. I think the best way is by feeding and bolstering up the good guys, and that way you don't have to be as aggressive with things like oregano, but um, you could certainly try to nuke them and do all the other, you know, gut brain axis, prokinetic, all of the other jazz that we talk about on this channel. Uh, you could try to neutralize the hydrogen sulfide gas itself with cheapo forms of zinc, 
So zinc oxide or zinc acetate would be good for that. Uh, you can try to heal the colon cells themselves. I forgot to talk about that one, darn it. Well, just really quick, I would say probiotics, prebiotics, generally speaking, and also butyrate. You can get butyrate in a supplement and you could either take them orally or you can crack a few open, put it in water and use it as an enema to deliver the butyrate into the colon where it belongs. But butyrate will help really rectify. <laughs> that was not intended to be a rectum joke, but it turned out to be. Um, butyrate will really help rectify some of the problem here at the colon. So have at it with butyrate supplementation and short chain fatty acids in general. Um, so you can target the colonocytes as I just mentioned there, and you can give your mitochondria some TLC with the numerous, numerous, numerous different supplements and herbs and compounds and polyphenols that the mitochondria like, as well as things like exercise and sunlight. Thank you so much for tuning in for, again, the world's longest video. But like I said, I really wanted to be thorough. I have my protocol that I know works pretty well, but I know that you guys, some of you have been on this journey for a really long time. And some of you were gonna comment, I've already tried oregano and bismuth and it didn't work, so what now? So I wanted to be thorough and do this deep dive on PubMed for you. So I hope that this is helpful and hopefully not overwhelming. And I will see you in the next video, probably about hydrogen sulfide, because again, this is a never ending series at this point. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video.